Ladies and gentlemen, hello and welcome to this webinar by Jane's on the Red Sea crisis, looking at the context, implications, capabilities and outlook. My name is Guy Anderson and presenting with me today is Jeremy Binney, Mike Plunkett and James Trigg. Before I pass over to my colleagues, let me remind you of recent events in the Red Sea region. Starting with the 7th of October, there was a Hamas-led coordinated attacks against targets in Israel, prompting Israel to launch Operation Swords of Iron in response. The following day, we had Hezbollah launch attacks against Israeli positions near the Israel-Lebanon border. Coming to the Red Sea region, on the 23rd of October, Ansar Allah threatened to target Israeli shipping in the Red Sea. On the 27th of October, the IDF entered the Gaza Strip. On the 14th of November, Ansar Allah repeated the threat to Israeli shipping. That was followed within days on 19th of November by the hijacking of the merchant vessel Galaxy Leader, a car carrier that was, of course, linked to Israel. On the 24th, the following week, we saw the first unmanned aerial vehicle strike against the Israeli link CMA CGM Saimi ship. Then on the 9th of December, Ansar Allah broadened targets to all Israel bound vessels from simply vessels that were owned or linked to Israel. On the 18th of December, the United States led Prosperity Guardian campaign launched to defend shipping in the Red Sea. On the 9th of January, uh, we had the 26th shipping attack and some would say the most significant to date. The following day, the United Nations Security Council issued a resolution condemning the Red Sea attacks and within two days, on the 12th of January, the United States led attacks against targets within Yemen. And with that, I will look to the order of presentation. So I will pass over to my colleague Jeremy Binney, our Middle East Defence Specialist, who will look at Ansar Allah's anti-ship capabilities. We'll then move on to Mike Plunkett, Senior Naval Platforms Analyst, looking at the Blue Naval Forces in theatre and their capabilities. I'll come back for the economic impact of the Red Sea unrest and then we'll pass over to James Trigg, our senior research analyst for the Middle East and North Africa, looking at the Ansar Allah attacks in the context of the conflict in Yemen. And with that, I will pass over to Jeremy Binney. Thank you, Guy. Um, I think it's important to realize that uh, what we're seeing here in terms of Ansar Allah, the Houthis anti-ship capabilities, this is something that has been uh, emerging for several years now. So since uh, at least uh, 2015, um, there have been attacks against the Saudi-led coalition uh, operating in the Red Sea area. Uh, so they, the group has developed a full sort of spectrum of capabilities uh, over these years and now we're really seeing what they can do with that. So we go into the first slide. Um, they do have various types of uh, small attack craft, much like the uh, Iran's Islamic Revolution Guards Corps Navy. So this one shown on the left hand side is the SF-1, uh, which as you can see has a heavy machine gun and um, a, a multiple rocket launcher. Generally considered to be a very unstable weapons platform, probably not likely to be used in attacks uh, any or effective attacks at that. Um, but at the same time, what these craft do is allow the Houthis to maintain a presence out at sea uh, and look intimidating towards merchant shipping. But also I think they, they, are, they serve another really important purposes in terms of uh, gathering information on what the ships are out there if they don't have their AIS transponders switched on and then radioing that back to the command center uh, so that that can be uh, that information can be assessed and then perhaps used for targeting 
and they actually have in their parade back in September they displayed the SF2 boat which is actually a dedicated uh, ISR asset and as you can see there it's got a, a commercial marine radar but that's also coupled with a, uh, a satellite communications antenna so in theory that could be bobbing around in the Red Sea uh, looking at what ships are out there with the radar and then transmitting that information back to base using the uh, the satellite communications antenna at a at a range of uh, beyond radio frequency um, distance. Next up, anti-ship missiles, which the Houthis uh, have been using since at least October 2016, when they uh, fired several towards a U.S. destroyer in the Red Sea. Although the first confirmed hit didn't actually happen until April 2018, when a Saudi tanker was damaged. Uh, by what was subsequently confirmed to be a Chinese C-802 uh, missile, um, which uh, interestingly enough had a French-made microturbo engine in it rather than uh, a Chinese copy. Um, the Houthis have two primary types of anti-ship missile, what they call the Al-Mandab-1, which they are open about uh, being a Chinese C-801, which was a type that was in service with the Yemeni Navy before the Houthi takeover in 2015. And the other missile is the Al Mandab 2, which is uh, a C 802 or uh, an Iranian made uh, C 802 derivative. Um, so the C 802 is basically the same as a C 801, but it has an air breathing turbojet engine instead of a rocket motor to give it uh, a much, much longer range. There's a, a bit of confusion as to whether the Yemeni Navy ever actually had C 802s as well as 801s, um, but it has been confirmed that Iran has. Uh, attempted to smuggle at least some uh, C-802s to Yemen and it's a fair assumption that uh, some did get through. As you can see from the Houthi infographic uh, on the right hand side of this slide, they claim the Al Mandab 2 has a range of 300 kilometers, uh, which essentially reflects what the Iranians claim for the latest derivative uh, of the C-802 that they make domestically. It hasn't actually been confirmed that the Houthis have a missile with a 300 kilometer range yet. What we do know is that uh, two of the ships that have been hit by anti-ship missiles have been uh, approximately 90 kilometers from Al Faza, which is uh, about as far south as the Houthis could deploy a coastal launcher system. Now, in theory, they do actually have a significantly longer range anti-ship cruise missiles. Um, so they, in the September parade, they unveiled the Sayad, which is uh, essentially an anti-ship version of what they call the Quds and is known in Iran as the Pave. And that uh, has a claim range of 800 kilometers with a 200 kilogram warhead. So uh, that is a very long range anti-ship missile and that uh, would require some, some, some fairly over the horizon ISR assets to gather targeting information. And arguably the Sagil uh, below is, is, is the more interesting one because it's the first time we've really seen this type of uh, cruise missile um, unveiled in this context as an anti-ship weapon. <laughs> Um, it's much smaller than the Syad, so a shorter range, a smaller warhead. Again, we don't know if this has been used yet, um, but it, it, it is something that is now out there. Now, the unmanned aerial vehicles, uh, many have been shot down now, and we're not, uh, it's unclear what is specifically being used, um, but it's likely to be the Samad series involved somewhere. Now, this is a multi-purpose type of UAV. It can be used as a one-way attack type loaded with an uh, explosive payload, or it can carry a, uh, cameras for carrying out reconnaissance or, 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 or surveillance. Um, so the, the, the basic is the Samad one with a claim range of 500 kilometers. That will actually, if you're carrying out real-time surveillance, that will obviously be a lot shorter. And the Samad three uh, claim range of uh, one, 1,600 kilometers, um, that's probably with the external, um, the extra fuel tank, which can't be seen fitted on, on this particular example from the, uh, from the parade. 
the ones actually being used to attack ships are probably the uh, Waid series, which are the now famous uh, Iranian Shahid 131 and 136s that have been used extensively in Ukraine. Um, so these are dedicated one way attack uh, types. Uh, they are very long range, so could take in targets all around the Arabian Peninsula, essentially. What we don't understand at this stage is how they're being used to target ships because they uh, typically use um, are pre-programmed with GPS coordinates, which they, they then fly to and attack. So what we don't know how the targeting is done for moving ships. Are they updating GPS coordinates with the latest ship positions using their, their forward ISR assets or, or is there uh, some other way of doing it. We've never seen one of these with an electro-optical um, uh, seeker, for example. So that remains something of a mystery, but we have seen these being used to att attack ships before. Now, uh, the new thing really in the current crisis the, is the use of anti-ship ballistic missiles. The Houthis unveiled their first one back in the September 22 parade in Al Hodeida first and that was called the Falak 1 with a claim range of 200 kilometers. Um, now we don't know if this is the one the type that's actually been used. Since then they have unveiled a surprisingly large number of uh, anti-ship ballistic missiles. So what essentially seems to be happening is that they're um, fitting their existing missiles with electro optical seekers uh, for the anti-ship role and then giving them a new name uh, so one of those is the what they're calling the muhit which you can see on the right hand side of this slide and that is a missile from yemen's old s-75 or sa-2 air defense system which they're already using as uh, in the ballistic missile role and now they've put the electro optical seeker on it and uh, now it's uh, they say that can be used for the anti-ship missile role ones we're probably most concerned with are what they are calling the asif and the Tankil, which are almost certainly anti-ship uh, variants of the Iranian Fatah 110 family of uh, tactical ballistic missiles. So the Asif, the, the specifications that the Houthis are given for it suggest it might be the uh, Khalij Fars uh, version of the Fatah 110, whilst the Tankil, which was uh, new for the um, parade last September, uh, is is probably what was unveiled in Iran as the Rad 500. Um, so that has a separating re-entry vehicle and a range of 500 kilometers. So uh, this is what we have seen so far in terms of range. Now uh, this represents a hypothetical launch from Taiz. Uh, now they could potentially get further out to the west in the Bader area. Um, but uh, it seems likely that uh, Taiz is a bit of a hub for uh, anti-ship missile attacks into the Gulf of Aden. And so what we've seen with the most recent attack on Gibraltar Eagle um, would, would represent a range of approximately 320 kilometres uh, from Taiz. So keep in mind the Houthis don't really have a uh, the ability, they might be able to have some covert spotters on the Gulf of, uh, Gulf of Aden, but they do, can't get their coastal launches there. They don't control that coastline. So what the anti-ship ballistic missiles do is give them the ability to do these long range missile attacks into the Gulf of Aden. And uh, you can see how that 300 kilometer range really takes in uh, a, an, an extra chunk of the major shipping lane going up into the Red Sea. One of the capabilities we haven't seen much of yet are the unmanned surface vessels, USVs, only one of which has uh, been reportedly used, exploding for unclear reasons in the middle of a shipping lane. This slide shows the Houthis' latest USVs as displayed in the parade last September. It's the two fan series with war ru warheads running from uh, 150 kilograms to the much more significant 500 kilograms. As you can see, they are equipped with cameras so that their operators on another boat can steer them into a moving vessel. 
uh, and that is a tactic that uh, they've demonstrated in the past, um, probably most significantly to destroy the Emirati logistics ship Swift in October 2016. Um, that's often erroneously reported to have been the victim of an anti-ship missile, but uh, uh, a Saudi-led coalition document says it was a uh, um, it was a USV rather than a missile. And then the Saudi frigate Al Medina was uh, very badly damaged the uh, following January by a uh, USV. The Houthis have also used USVs to attack ships in port, including at uh, King Abdulaziz naval base in Jeddah. Um, that threat now seems to be largely mitigated by the deployment of floating booms around the mouths of ports and bases. Uh, but it is possible that this is something the Houthis could turn to to carry out longer range attacks on ports as they widen their target set uh, during the current crisis. And what we haven't seen at all so far is our sea mines. Now, they've uh, shown us over the years uh, a whole uh, range of sea mines, many of them tethered impact types like these ones. Now they have been used in the past and uh, they have created a problem, especially when they break free from their tethers, at which point they essentially become completely indiscriminate weapons. If the Houthis wanted to shut down uh, maritime trade through the Red Sea completely, then this is, this is something they could potentially use. They would have no way of really discriminating against whose ships they were targeting uh, at all. Now, um, these, as I say, are impact mines, but they also have unveiled uh, what they describe as mines with acoustic and magnetic uh, sensors. Now, potentially, these could be used to tune to specific targets, so the magnetic or acoustic signatures or particular vessels, and this is a way potentially that they could discriminate um, perhaps between large uh, freighters or tankers and warships, but really do they have the capability to, uh, uh, or, or the information on acoustic or magnetic signatures to, to program these effectively? I'm not sure, but I think we need to bear to keep this in mind that this is something the Houthis could go to if the uh, situation, situation escalates further. Thank you very much. I'm now going to hand you over to Mike Plunkett. Thank you, Jeremy. I'm going to cover here the current blue forces in theatre and in particular those that are actively engaged in Operation Prosperity Guardian and have been defending merchant ships in the vicinity of the Bab el Mendeb Straits from the current wave of Houthi attacks. I will then go on to look at the relevant capabilities that these ships possess. As can be seen from this graphic, the deployment is predominantly an American one, as might be expected. The US Navy now has what is effectively a reinforced carrier battle group in the Southern Red Sea, centered on USS Dwight D. Eisenhower and her escorts, the cruiser USS Philippine Sea and the guided missile destroyers USS Mason and USS Gravely. This group entered the Red Sea from the Gulf of Aden in early January 2024 and joined up with two other guided missile destroyers, the USS Laboon and USS Stetham. In addition to the substantial surface presence, the US Navy also has a guided missile submarine in the area, USS Florida, an Ohio-class submarine that was converted to fire Tomahawk cruise missiles instead of Trident ballistic missiles. The submarine transited the Suez Canal in November 2023 and has been operating in the region since then. As well as launching Tomahawks, USS Florida can also act as a base for Special Operations Forces. The Royal Navy has deployed the Type 45 guided missile destroyer HMS Diamond to the area, and she has been actively involved in countering Houthi drones and anti-ship missiles launched from Yemen. The French Navy also has a presence in the region with the Aquitaine class frigate Languedoc. Whilst the French are not formally part of the American-led Operation Prosperity Guardian, Languedoc has engaged a number of Houthi targets in recent weeks. Italy and Spain also have warships in the Red Sea, however these have not been declared to Prosperity Guardian and have not engaged in combat operations to date. Greece has announced that it will send the frigate HS Hydra to join Prosperity Guardian, and Denmark has also pledged to contribute a frigate, although the exact unit has yet to be formally identified. The Royal Navy has deployed the Type 23 frigate HMS Richmond, and it is likely that she will relieve HMS Diamond when she arrives in theatre. Germany is considering sending a ship, but it is unclear whether this is to join Prosperity Guardian 
or to be part of some other as yet undefined European equivalent. India has also stated that it would deploy warships to the Red Sea, although whether these will act independently or as part of the existing coalition is unclear. China also has a presence in the region in the form of the 45th Naval Escort Task Force, which is on station in the Gulf of Aden and comprises the Luyang 3 guided missile destroyer Urumqi and the Jiankai 2 class frigate Yitlinyi plus a supply ship. These units have not taken any active role in the conflict to date. However, if Chinese-owned, crewed or flagged merchant ships are threatened, then it will be interesting to see how the PLAN reacts. With regards to the combat capabilities of the ships highlighted on the previous slide, USS Dwight D. Eisenhower has currently has four squadrons of F-18 Super Hornets embarked, which have been used for both air defense and strike operations, plus a squadron of EA-18G Growler electronic warfare and defense suppression aircraft, and a squadron of E-2D airborne surveillance aircraft. The cruiser Philippine Sea is primarily an air defense ship, and is fitted with a large number of vertical launch system cells, all of which are capable of firing either Tomahawk land attack cruise missiles or a wide range of surface-to-air missiles from the standard family, including the SM-2, SM-3 and SM-6. In addition, she is fitted with a pair of 127mm guns and a pair of 20mm phalanx close-in weapon systems and a pair of 25mm Bushmaster cannons. All of these guns have at least a limited anti-air capability but would likely only be used against UAVs. Laboon and Statham are Flight 1 Arleigh Burke class destroyers, and as such they each have 90 VLS cells available. The VLS on these ships is the same as on the Philippine Sea, and they are capable of carrying the same weapons loadout as the cruiser. By contrast, Mason and Gravely are Flight 2A Arleigh Burke class, two destro class destroyers, which means that they have a slightly larger number of VLS cells than their older sisters. They too carry a mix of Tomahawk and Standard, but are also fitted with the Evolved Sea Sparrow missile, which, although much shorter range than the Standard, can be quad-packed into a VLS cell. In other words, while a VLS cell can only take one Standard SAM, it will accommodate four ESSM, which is a big boost to magazine depth. All the Arleigh Burks are also equipped with a single 127mm gun and either one or two phalanx systems. As mentioned previously, USS Florida is primarily a Tomahawk shooter, and while she can carry up to 154 of these missiles, the exact number is unknown and will be dependent on how much space has been given over to Special Operations Forces. HMS Diamond is equipped with 48 Silver A50 VLS cells for Sea Viper missiles, with the loadout being a mix of the long-range Aster 30 and the shorter-ranged Aster 15. She also has a 114mm main gun, plus two phalanx systems and a pair of 30mm ASCG cannons. Of these, only the last two have any anti-air capability, the software needed to provide that capability to the main gun having been retired as a savings measure some years ago. It is worth noting that during the recent large-scale engagement that HMS Diamond was part of, at least one Houthi drone was downed by gunfire, reportedly from a 30mm cannon. It is likely that we will see more of the less challenging targets being engaged with guns in the future, as it will allow the finite supply of missiles to be reserved for anti-ship cruise missiles and ballistic missiles. As mentioned previously, Longer Dock is not a dedicated anti-airship, and as such her air defence capability is fairly limited, with only 16 A43 VLS cells for short-range AS-15 missiles, plus a 76mm gun and a pair of 20mm cannon. However, she does also possess 16 Silver A-70 VLS cells for MDCN land attack cruise missiles. MDCN is a surface launch naval version of the French Scalp EG cruise missile, which in turn is the French version of Storm Shadow and which has been deployed to great effect by Ukraine. Between them, these ships possess a large number of VLS cells which can be filled with a variety of weapons capable of countering Houthi weapons. However, it is still a finite number of weapons, and at present, VLS cannot be reloaded, reloaded at sea. Therefore, empty cells can only be refilled by going alongside somewhere, and this will need to happen sooner or later. The Royal Navy reportedly began rep stockpiling Sea Viper missiles at a location in the region recently, although where exactly is unknown. It is likely that when HMS R Richmond arrives on station, she will relieve HMS Diamond, who will then proceed to a friendly port to reload and conduct any necessary maintenance. It is also likely that the US Navy ships will be relieved at some point in future by other equivalent units. 
Thank you very much, Mike. So now looking at the economic impact of Red Sea unrest. So firstly, if we look at canal traffic, and this is data we've drawn from the IMF, we can see that back in October, 23rd of October specifically, when Ansar Allah warned Israeli ships in the Red Sea would be targeted, there was actually very little movement in terms of Suez transits. The, uh, even by November, when Ansar Allah stated it, it would search for Israeli shipping, and with the hijacking of MV Galaxy Leader, very little action. There was a slight decline uh, following uh, Galaxy Leader's hijacking. Uh, although actually after Ansar Allah stated that attacks would broaden to all ships bound for Israel, there was something of an uptick. So it seemed that these were viewed as threats at this stage. The big change, of course, came where there was a significant increase in the tempo of attacks between the 15th and the 18th of December. <coughs> now, at that point, operators are representing something like 70% of global marine traffic suspended or diverted uh, Red Sea sailings. Uh, then we saw the 18th US-led Prosperity Guardian. Uh, the upshot was by the 8th of January, uh, the most recent data we have, uh, Suez Canal transits are down 29% on the level at the start of October uh, based on rolling seven day averages. So there's a year on year decline of 24%. To put this in context, this brings Suez transits down uh, to a level comparable with that of the COVID-19 lockdown era. So this has been a very, very significant decline. Now, if we look at some of the implications of events, obviously in the world, uh, this follows the disruption of the COVID-19 pandemic, the ongoing Russia-Ukraine conflict, uh, plus the regional impacts of hostilities in uh, Israel and Gaza. So uh, one example that was a sharp decline in tourism revenue, particularly in Jordan, Israel itself, and of course, Egypt. Trade disruption, we'd say, threatens to undermine some of the most fragile economies in the Middle East. Specifically, we'd identify Egypt and Jordan. Looking at the broader economy, shipping rates, of course, have soared. Uh, this is creating inflationary pressures. Uh, as an example, the, bench, uh, the benchmark uh, Shanghai Container Freight Index, that is up 300% since October. So uh, shipping from China to Europe, the price has gone up by about 300%. It has tripled since hostilities began in October. Extended shipping times are putting pressure on supply chains, uh, those that are based on just-in-time production processes. We have seen some car manufacturers in Europe who've already paused production because of difficulties getting components from Asia to the factories. So we have inflationary pressures from elevated energy, transport prices, those are threatening to reignite inflation just as there were hopes that it was coming under control. Now, if you look at some of the specific impacts, so Europe and beyond, uh, goods trade of Asia, of course, has been disrupted. Uh, that is causing supply chain difficulties, and we are seeing inflationary pressures. Now, for Israel itself, we have seen government revenue uh, and ec economic activity degraded by the conflict. That is largely because a lot of working age people have been uh, taken out of circulation uh, by the war, by the call up of reserves. Uh, if we look at the port of Islet, uh, there have been severe impediments to traffic that has hampered Israel's bilateral trade with Asia. We do see inflationary pressures as plausible given goods trade disruption. 
Now for Egypt, uh, Red Sea unrest follows the economic blows of COVID-19 and uh, the Ukraine conflict. Uh, and bear in mind, Egypt is in quite a fragile economic position at present. Uh, Suez Canal transit fees, uh, a major source of foreign currency, those are down by more than a quarter. Egypt's good trade, good trade with Asia is likely to have been disrupted. Uh, Jordan, challenging backdrop, high energy food import dependence and 20% unemployment even before the crisis began. Aqaba is Jordan's only port. It's critical to goods imports and exports. And when we look at exports, particularly fertilizers. So I'm going to look at Egypt and Jordan and zoom in a little because we'd say they are the most vulnerable. So the background in Egypt, uh, the Egyptian pound lost half of its value against the dollar in the year to March. Inflation reached 35 <coughs> percent. Excuse me. Foreign reserves have dwindled. They're down from 45 billion to 35 billion. And there was direct disruption from the Israel Gaza conflict. So tourism took a hit. Uh, it was down in the months after October by about 10 percent. Uh, gas exports were briefly disrupted. So the Suez transit fees, these are a major source of foreign currency in a country which has seen its reserves dwindle and inflation rocket. So in a, uh, in a typical year, something like $8 billion per annum, that's 8% of foreign revenue, 2% of GDP. <coughs> and we've seen that revenues and by early January are already down 40%. So the Egyptian goods exports to Asia, that's highly likely to have been disruptive. Uh, that equals 14% of goods exports in 2022. Uh, this is $6.6 .6 billion. It's not an inconsequential sum. So looking at Jordan, uh, they have unemployment rate of 20%. Youth unemployment is far, far higher, and this is a very young population. Pre-existing commodity inflation has caused uh, food and energy subsidies to balloon, and that led state debt to reach 92% of GDP. <coughs> so the Israel-Gaza conflict has already hit tourism. Uh, one indicator we looked at, uh, rental cars, cancellations for December were at 90%. So that suggests that tourism is way, way down. Uh, and of course, this is a major employer. Now, coming back to the Red Sea, Aqaba is Jordan's only port city. Freight traffic was down 46% in early January. So what does that actually mean? Well, potash and potassium exports, they account for 17% of national export, exports, 3% of GDP, <laughs> virtually all potash depart Aqaba because most of it goes to Asia. It's also a significant container port for onward transit elsewhere in the Middle East. Uh, the upshot of this, IMF uh, approved support uh, on the 10th of January to help Jordan weather what it called a challenging external environment. Now, if you look at the broader economic impact, we can say there are political implications elsewhere in the world and probably quite broadly felt. Let's remember there are 64 countries worldwide holding elections in 2024. Uh, as a US president once said, it is very much the economy and a lot of countries in the world are going to face inflationary pressures and see recoveries, post-COVID recoveries coming under pressure. We're seeing an additional blow to globalized supply chains. Uh, we've already seen blows in the forms of the Ukraine-Russia crisis, uh, the Ukraine-Russia war rather, and the COVID-19 crisis. So plausibly, we're going to see moves towards greater onshore or even regional resilience. Uh, we see additional economic pressures being heaped on some of the weakest economies in the region, specifically Jordan and Egypt, uh, very much vulnerable if the Red Sea challenges persist. Now, on this slide, we've got James' proprietary country stability indicators, specifically looking at economic risk. 
Now, if we look at, say, Israel, Saudi Arabia, and the UAE, uh, their economic risk, their pre-existing risk is low. Uh, it is in the region of, well, it's below two. It's in the green zone. If we look at Jordan and Egypt uh, specifically, they are what we'd say are in the, the high risk category. Jordan slightly less so than Egypt, uh, which is very much into the deep red zone. Uh, the current challenges are unlikely certainly to help this risk profile. They're very likely to make things worse. And now with that, so I'll pass over to my colleague James Trigg. Thanks, Guy. So since the outset of its attacks on shipping in the Red Sea, Ansar Allah has maintained consistent messaging that these actions are in support of Hamas and other Palestinian armed groups fighting against Israeli forces. On the 23rd of October, the Prime Minister of Ansar Allah's appointed National Salvation Government, Abdul Aziz bin Habtor, claimed that missiles and drones launched by Ansar Allah on the 19th had struck targets in Israel. Furthermore, Abdul also warned that, quote, Zionist ships in the Red Sea will be targeted if Israel continued with its offensive against Hamas in Gaza. On the 14th of November, the leader of Ansa Allah, Abdul Malik Al Houthi, vowed that Ansa Allah would, quote, constantly monitor and search for any Israeli ship in the Red Sea. Following the inauguration of the US-led naval operation Prosperity Guardian on the 18th of December, a spokesperson for Ansar Allah, Mohammed Abdul Salam, posted a statement on X, formerly Twitter, vowing that the naval task force would, quote, not stop Yemen from continuing its legitimate operations in support of Gaza. Amid Ansar Allah's Red Sea attacks, it must also be remembered that the domestic situation in Yemen remains an ongoing conflict in which Ansar Allah is involved and has sought to take advantage of the uptick in recruitment the group has enjoyed since the outbreak of conflict between Israel and Hamas. When Abdul Malik Al Houthi spoke on the 14th of November, he also called for, quote, countries that geographically separate Yemen from Palestine to open up a land port for passage. Were this to be achieved, Al Houthi claimed that, quote, hundreds of thousands of free heroic Mujahideen from Yemen would move to support the Hamas led forces against Israel. Regardless of the prospects of success for Al Houthi's plans for such a land passage, in Yemen, the chance to battle against the forces of Israel has been deployed as an enticement to draw fighters to Ansar Allah's ranks. On the 16th of November, Ansar Allah announced the graduation of 10,000 military fighters from a ceremony in Yemen's northern Damar governorate. Similar events took place in Sana'a on the 2nd of December and the Abs district in Yemen's northern Hajar governorate on the 24th of December. The South 24 Center for News and Studies described the 16th November parade as, quote, crowds of armed men wearing traditional tribal attire, along with military hats and jackets, unorganized and random, suggesting that the new fighters were trained in a very short period, likely beginning after the outbreak of the current Israeli-Palestinian conflict on the 7th of October. And while James assesses that the numbers reported by Ansar Allah are almost certainly overinflated and likely conflate the number of Yemenis present at large protests with the numbers of fighters apparently recruited, James does assess that it is likely Ansar Allah has succeeded in drawing new fighters to its ranks under the banner of opposing Israel. Without means to reach Israel, however, James assesses that these fighters are very likely to be set to be mobilized against Ansar Allah's domestic enemies in Yemen. Principally, the forces aligned with the Presidential Leadership Council, Yemen's executive, since the abdication of President Hadi in April 2022, and the Southern Transitional Council, or STC. According to a 7th November report by Arab News, a military official with Yemen's armed forces, Rashad al Maklafi, reported that Ansar Allah had amassed fighters and deployed military vehicles and heavy weapons outside the central city of Marib 
and outside the besieged city of Taiz since the outbreak of hostilities between Israel and Hamas on October 7th. Arab News uh, concluded that Ansar Allah have used the Gaza conflict to plan a fresh military offensive against government controlled territories and indeed a renewed An Ansar Allah offensive against pro PLC forces based around Taiz was reported on the 6th of November. Subsequently, the Sana'a Center for Strategic Studies reported what it described as one of the largest attacks on pro-government forces defending the government-held city of Marib on the 7th of November by Ansar Allah. Ansar Allah's consistent message with regards to its targeting of Israel also serves a propagandistic purpose in the group's conflict with the Southern Transitional Council. For example, the passage of legislation prohibiting and criminalizing recognition of or normalization with Israel by Ansar Allah's Supreme Political Council on the 5th of January highlighted and deepened the contrast between Ansar Allah and the president of the SDC, Idarus Kasim al Zubaidi, who has previously announced in February 2021 his readiness to normalize relations with Israel in the event of southern Yemen once again becoming an independent state. More recently, al Zabaidi offered for the STC to assist with the international coalition protecting shipping through the Red Sea during a meeting with the US Special Envoy to Yemen, Timothy Lenderking, on the 9th of December. More recently, on the 15th of January, al Zabaidi requested military equipment, capacity building, training and intelligence sharing from the US to ensure PLC and STC troops could properly capitalize on US airstrikes against Ansar Allah. In a country where popular opinion has led to protests denouncing Israel across governorates controlled by all three of Yemen's major factions since October 2023, Jane's assesses that Ansar Allah will very likely seek to direct both popular anger and renewed military operations against forces aligned with the SDC in order to take advantage of the upswell in anti-Israeli sentiment amongst the Yemeni population and its newly recruited fighters. Beyond the conflict between Yemeni factions, Ansar Allah's attacks on Red Sea shipping have also raised concerns and complications for the fate of ongoing peace negotiations between the Yemeni group and Saudi Arabia. Peace talks have continued between Riyadh and Ansar Allah despite the collapse of a UN-sponsored ceasefire which lasted between April and October 2022. Cross-border attacks by Ansar Allah against the Kingdom have also ceased, though allegations of cross-border fire by Saudi border forces into Yemeni territory persisted throughout 2023. Following five days of negotiations between Saudi Arabian officials and a delegation representing Ansar Allah in Riyadh in September 2023, a statement by the Saudi Ministry of Foreign Affairs praised what they described as the positive results of the talks. With the outbreak of conflict between Israel and Hamas, however, Saudi Arabia has found itself caught between competing priorities. While the British Secretary of State for Defence, Grant Shapps, stated in the 10th January press conference that the UK, its Western allies and Saudi Arabia, quote, were all agreed that Ansar Allah attacks on Red Sea shipping could not continue, Jane's assesses that Riyadh will almost certainly be concerned that any escalation in the conflict between Ansar Allah and the coalition of nations operating in the Red Sea also risks a resumption in attacks by Ansar Allah against Saudi Arabia if Riyadh is perceived to be an ally to those nations, jeopardizing the peace process. These concerns have been heightened by conflicting messaging from Ansar Allah during the Israel-Hamas conflict. For example, the Ansar Allah spokesperson Mohammed Abdul Salam adopted a concili conciliatory tone on the 11th of January when he stated that the Ansar Allah Saudi peace process had, quote, nothing to do with what was happening in the Gaza Strip, suggesting Ansar Allah's continued intent to pursue a negotiated settlement with Saudi Arabia. However, Abdul Salam's words stood in stark contrast to threats made by a member of Ansar Allah's political bureau, Mohammed al bukaiti in a 5th December interview with France 24 Arabic. 
al Bakaiti stated that if Riyadh and Abu Dhabi act to protect Israel, then Ansar Allah would destroy their oil facilities and attack oil ships, suggesting at least the existence of a faction within Ansar Allah which sees their indirect conflict with Israel as a greater priority than preserving the fragile ceasefire with Saudi Arabia. Amidst these opposing priorities, Jaynes assesses that Saudi Arabia will likely remain cautious about participating in or even signaling overt support for actions taken against Ansar Allah. This cautious approach will be taken to preserve the burgeoning priest process. Memories of Ansar Allah's previous attacks on Saudi cities and oil infrastructure, such as the March 2022 attacks on the depot at Jeddah and a liquefied gas plant in Yambu, remain pertinent to Saudi decision makers. James assesses that Saudi support for further actions against Ansar Allah would likely increase only if the US planned a more robust campaign to degrade and destroy Ansar Allah in its entirety. In such a case, Riyadh would benefit from Ansar Allah's complete military defeat rather than a compromised and negotiated settlement and therefore be far more amenable to proactive kinetic actions. At present, American intentions for prolonged military deployment against Ansar Allah appear remote and so Riyadh shall continue to avoid becoming embroiled in the Yemeni conflict once again. That brings us to the end of this presentation. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank Guy, Jeremy and Mike for their contributions. If you have any questions that we've not answered during the session, please email them to us at the address on your screens and we will get back to you with a written response. Thank you and goodbye.